Good evening. I am Hasita Tisera, your moderator, and I welcome all of you to this webinar on public health response to COVID-19, an update, organized by the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka. This webinar will also be live streamed on the college Facebook site. Our chairpersons tonight are Dr. Nihal Abesinghe, President, College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka, and Dr. Sudat Samarivira, Vice President, College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka, and the Chief Epidemiologist. Before I hand over the uh, proceedings to the chairpersons to introduce the two eminent speakers who, who have joined, very briefly tell you. We expect the participants to keep your mics muted at all times, please. After both presentations, there will be a discussion and a Q&A session. If you have any questions or clarifications to be raised, please be brief and you can do so in one of three ways. You can either write and send in your questions at any time via the chat box below. We will collectively take them up during the discussion. You can write your questions during the discussion to enable our speakers to see them directly and answer them uh, during the discussion. Or you may raise your hand and we will enable you directly to ask the questions yourself. In which case, please say your tell us your name and your affiliations before you ask the question. Please note that this session will be automatically recorded by CCPSL for educational purposes. Let me now invite Dr. Nihal Abhisinghe, the president of the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka to welcome the participants and, and to introduce the two eminent speakers. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Hasita, And thank you uh, for uh, the introduction to the, this webinar. And the College of Community Physicians, uh, I mean, that is uh, where Hasita is representing in our uh, council. And he is also a consultant epidemiologist working at the Epidemiology Unit Ministry of Health. And uh, now uh, today, uh, this uh, webinar, we, the College of Community Physicians, we organize uh, uh, this webinar because that uh, now it's uh, almost more than two months of this second uh, wave of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Sri Lanka. And we, we really wanted to discuss the implementation of the, uh, the, the public health measures uh, uh, in the country. And in the first wave, the College of Community Physicians, uh, we developed uh, quite a number of uh, guidelines along with the Ministry of Health. And we have shared those uh, with the Ministry of Health and, and many others uh, within the country and the public health personnel. I'm sure that uh, they are utilizing those guidelines uh, that prepared by the College of Community Physicians during the first wave. Now, during this second wave that uh, we are implementing the guidelines that we prepared uh, during the first wave, but we know that uh, there are some issues uh, pertaining to the implementation. So therefore that uh, the College of Community Physicians, we thought that uh, it is good to discuss uh, these uh, issues with the public health personnel and those who are interested and, and the clinicians who are engaged in uh, management of uh, COVID-19 patients and the managers, uh, the administrators who are uh, involving in managing and administering the, uh, the this COVID management uh, administrative measures. So uh, today uh, for the our webinar today, we have two eminent uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, let me introduce the first panelist uh, today, the first speaker, and we, uh, we are very uh, grateful to uh, Professor Malik Srial Peris, uh, very eminent uh, virologist uh, in the world. And now today he is with us and a Sri Lankan. We are proud to be with you, sir. And Professor Malik Priyal Peris is a professor and chair in virology at the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. And he is a clinical and public health virologist with a particular interest in emerging virus diseases and at the uh, animal human interface, including influenza, coronaviruses, uh, and others. His research uh, encompasses the pathogens, innate immune responses, transmission, ecology, and epidemiology of human and 
animal influenza viruses. His collaborative research has proved understanding on the emergence and pathogens of the 2009 pandemic H1N1 virus and on avian influenza virus H5N1, H9, uh, H2N2, and H7N9 using uh, One Health approach. And these studies have provided evidence-based options for the control of these viruses in poultry and humans. In 2003, he played a key role in the discovery that uh, novel coronavirus was the cause of SARS, its diagnosis and pathogenesis and contributed to its control. He is researching the newly emerged SARS coronavirus 2. And he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of London in 2006, fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology in 2016, and Foreign Associate of National Academy of Sciences in 2017. He was awarded the officer de la Legion d'Honneur France 2017, Mahathir Science Award, Academy Science Saints Malaysia 2007, and Silver uh, Bahunia Star SBS Hong Kong SAR 2008. So we are very proud of you, sir. And we, uh, we College of Community Positions uh, of Sri Lanka, we uh, uh, cordially invite you to uh, start our webinar today. And over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nihal, uh, for inviting me to take part in this. And I'm very happy to do this for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, of course, uh, invitation from you, uh, uh, because uh, many of the audience may not know, but um, I worked with uh, Nihal back in 1985 during the first major Japanese encephalitis outbreak in Sri Lanka in, uh, in the North Central province. And of course, I, I know main, a number of the others uh, participating as well. But I think the other reason why I'm so happy to, uh, to talk to the um, College of Community Medicine is that what this pandemic has really shown us is that the importance of uh, public health. Um, I think it is not the rich countries that have done the best, uh, um, for example, places like the United States and the UK, but uh, it is uh, places where there is a good, strong public health response. So I think public health community medicine is uh, fundamentally important. So uh, I was asked to, um, to, to first talk about these mutations that, uh, that uh, uh, have been emerged. Now I'm trying to share my screen, but um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I cannot share my screen with, oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. All right. Right, so, uh, so let me just quickly um, talk about the background to these mutations and, and what is important about these mutations uh, and why, why sequencing of viruses is important. And I think Nilika, Professor Nilika Malavige will, will follow on from data from Sri Lanka. So firstly, um, I think talking about mutations, I'm afraid I have to take you back to <laughs> your, your virology. Uh, so this is just to show you the, the SARS coronavirus 2. Um, as you know, it's an RNA virus. The nucleic acid is inside here. And on the surface, you have these prominent spikes. So it is these spikes that attach to the cell and the virus gets in and replicates inside the cell. So this also is fundamentally important. So without a living cell, there is no living virus, to be honest. You know, um, but these viruses can only multiply inside another living cell of some sort. Um, now, once the virus gets in, it starts making viral proteins and it starts replicating its RNA. And these two get put together to form new virus particles. Now, in this mutation phase, RNA copying uh, has more mistakes than, for example, when the human DNA is copied uh, from, say, um, um, the mother to the baby. Uh, when RNA viruses copy RNA to RNA, there are more errors. Um, but 
actually, uh, so, so this is why viruses like influenza, HIV, um, uh, and coronaviruses do have higher mutation rates, but actually coronaviruses are, have lower mutation rates than uh, viruses like SARS, uh, like viruses like influenza and HIV. Now, if you look at this whole viral genome, it's about uh, 30,000 nucleotides, letters, if you like. And uh, what you see here, these little spikes here are places in the genome where mutations have been recognized. So as I said, because when the virus replicates, these mutations occur. Most of these mutations are bad for the virus, so they don't survive and we don't see them. Uh, some of them do, uh, the mutations do survive, but they may, may, may not make much of a difference to the virus in any of its properties. Uh, it is only, so we are only worried about these mutations when they change the property of the virus. For example, change the capacity to transmit or change capacity to cause disease or increase the capacity to cause disease, or now, of course, uh, escape vaccine. Now, you have to keep in mind that the primary driver for the virus is transmission. The virus really doesn't care about causing severe disease. Uh, it doesn't help the virus, right? The virus just, in terms of evolution, just needs to transmit from one person to another. If it doesn't, the virus dies out. So inevitably, it will select for those mutations that enhance transmission. Right, so um, this is a, is a family tree, if you like. I, I realize it sounds, uh, looks very complicated, but uh, this is uh, the start of the virus here. And you can see that as the virus has spread across China and across the world, the virus has undergone diversification through this mutation process. Uh, so these are the very early viruses that you can see that, you know, two or three different colors. And as it spread worldwide, you can see more and more diversity. So it's just like a family tree, you, you know, your family trees, you have your uh, parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, etc. So it, it is it is essentially a, a tree going that way, if you like. So this kind of shows the kind of global diversity uh, of coronaviruses, uh, the, the SARS coronavirus 2 at the moment. Now, why are we interested in doing sequencing of these viruses? And there are a couple of reasons why. So firstly, um, now what I'm showing you here in these, uh, in these dots is uh, this is the transmission clusters in Hong Kong. So you can see that most of these patients transmit only to one or one or two people. Uh, so they are not really the, the people who really drive and maintain the transmission in the community. But there are people like this one, this one, this one, where there are large clusters of transmission. So one of the questions we want to know when you have a cluster is actually, uh, although epidemiologically they may be linked, you may think they are linked, is, is there proof that one particular cluster is caused by the same virus? So that's one question that sequencing can answer. Um, and then you may have two or three clusters and you may want to know actually, are they linked? Are these clusters linked to the same chain? Um, then when you're trying to control the outbreak, say whether it be in Hong Kong or Sri Lanka, you may want to know whether the this current wave is going on. Is that due to the original um, uh, Minuangoda cluster or are there new introductions? Again, sequencing can help you to address that as well. And then of course, finally, do these viruses acquire any uh, mutations that have biological significance, meaning increased transmissibility, pathogenicity, or escaping uh, vaccine protection. And what I'm showing you here is just an example from, from Hong Kong's data. Uh, Hong Kong has had uh, a couple of waves. And what you can see here is the third wave, and uh, which was controlled. And now we are in the fourth wave. And one of the questions is, did this fourth wave come from leftover patients from this uh, third wave? And what you can see when you look at this phylogenetic tree, this is the third wave viruses, and these are the fourth wave viruses. So very clearly, it's a new introduction that has come in from, from outside. So essentially coming through 
the quarantine system uh, that um, has failed at some point. Um, maybe I just skip that one. Yeah. Now let's get on to these mutations that uh, have created a lot of interest. So, as I said, there have been many, many mutations, most of which are of no interest, no, no significance. The first mutation that was of biological significance is this D614G in the spike protein. You remember the spike protein is fundamental to att attaching to the host cell. So it's very crucial at the first step of infection. So this is a mutation in that particular protein. And you can see that uh, uh, before this mutation arose, all these viruses were these green viruses, which had the D at 614. And then once the mutation arose, um, more and more of the viruses globally have uh, have, have got this mutation. Um, and the, the, the most likely explanation is that the viruses with this mutation have a better fitness for transmission. So if you look globally, you can see now that most of the viruses worldwide are these yellow viruses. Uh, these yellow viruses with this mutation, the 614G, have essentially displaced the 614D and and very likely because of increased replication fitness and transmission fitness and there is some experimental data to support that as well so again as i'm sure nilika will talk about this the first wave and the second wave in sri lanka now of course uh, we come to the current mutations the one in the uk and the one in south africa um, so again these these green ones are the current viruses and here you see a mutation a, a lineage which has a couple of mutations and this is what we call the uk lineage or b.1.1.7 lineage and here we have another lineage which is the south african lineage now you will you will notice that both these lineages do share one particular mutation in common, uh, also in the spike gene, and but they have other mutations also in the spike gene, because this is so important to the virus attachment transmission, and also vaccine escape. Um, so they share one mutation, but there are other mutations that are different. That's one point. The other point is even though they are share this same mutation 501, they have arisen separately. So there are independent, uh, independently arisen uh, this uh, 501 mutation. Clearly, it is important for the virus. It is giving the virus some benefit, right? Otherwise, this won't happen. Right, so let's first talk about the UK virus. Now, again, this is a family tree. You can see these viruses are spreading one to another. They are fairly close to each other. But then we have this very long branch and we have this UK variant. And you can see it has already, it has acquired 23 mutations during this period. Uh, now, again, this also is rather technical, but uh, I hope I can explain this simply. So the mutation rate of the virus is fairly consistent. So you can see that over time from March, April, June, July, August, uh, the, the distance a particular virus has traveled, has mutated, the rate is fairly constant. That's why you have a straight line here, right? Uh, all the way from, uh, these are viruses in the UK, all the way from March to November. Then you have this uh, UK lineage. You can see it is completely displaced. Uh, so there has been some very rapid mutation taking place uh, that has um, made that virus um, undergo you know very rapid change now how can such rapid mutations occur one possibility is a virus that persists for a long time in an immunocompromised patient there are a number of examples of viruses uh, persisting for for many many weeks or sometimes months in immunocompromised patients and also such viruses undergo uh, well, acquire a lot of mutations uh, in the same patient um, and as I said, it, it has a number of mutations in the spike that do appear to be biologically relevant. Now, 
what what is the what is the epidemiological significance of this um so the uk scientists do believe um, scientists and epidemiologists do believe that this mutation is associated with increased transmission and the reason one of the important reasons why is that in the regions uh, that is in london and, and south england uh, uh, south, south part of england where this mutation is predominant the the reproduction number rt is around 1.5 whereas in other areas of the uk it is around 1.1 so it does seem that in those areas where this virus is the dominant virus it is the virus is spreading faster of course there could be other explanations for this i mean it could be that you know the virus is spreading faster because in some parts of the country people are behaving badly uh, so you know you, you have to be careful when you when you interpret this but then there is also some preliminary data that patients who have this particular mutation do seem to have a higher viral load than others the preliminary data so far does not indicate that this mutation is associated with increase in severity so it's only increase in transmission again up to now there is no evidence that uh, this mutation is conferring escape from vaccine immunity but again the experiments are still ongoing the definitive experiments are still ongoing and another uh, important point is that one of these mutations in the spike may lead to a false negative in some rt pcr assays which target the spike gene uh, now, as you know, uh, when we do RT-PCR assays, and I think Nidika will talk about it in more detail, but we target more than one uh, gene, right? So um, uh, just because the mutation in the spike gene may make that negative doesn't mean you will completely miss that, but you have to be aware that you may have that situation. And indeed, people are using this to for rapid detection of this virus as well. Now, this mutant, um, well, now looking back, I think was first detected going back to September. So it is surprising that it is not uh, only present in the UK. We don't even know whether it started in the UK. It is detected in Denmark, in Australia, Japan, Brazil, South Korea, USA, Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, in some of these places, certainly in, in Hong Kong, these are people who, who just directly came from the UK. But in other places, uh, it is uh, in, for example, in the US, the positive case has no travel history. So obviously it is already transmitting in the USA. Right, so the second mutation of interest is this South African mutation. Uh, again, the mutations are in this spike. Again, this key protein of the virus. Uh, it has again been detected from the 5th of October, the first detection. Again, for the same reasons, like I uh, explained for the UK virus, it does seem to increase transmission and it seems to be becoming the dominant lineage in certain parts of South Africa. Um, um, there seems to be higher viral load uh, in patients who have this mutation. Uh, and again, we don't know about severity and uh, vaccine escape. Now, having said that, before I hand over to Nilika to talk about the Sri Lankan situation, I just want to uh, point out that finding these mutations depends on whether you're doing sufficient sequencing to look for them. Now, the UK is one of the countries in the world which is sequencing the most, meaning about 10% of all positive PCR positive uh, samples are being sequenced. So you have to be careful. So, I mean, you know, just because the this mutant was discovered in the UK, it doesn't mean that the UK is the only place that is having the virus. Um, and it doesn't mean that, um, you know, I mean, just to be topical, Right now, we are having um, people coming from different parts of the world. Um, and um, just, you know, let's say, whether it be Russia or Ukraine, uh, just because it has not been reported from there doesn't mean that um, this mutation may not be there as well. So you really have to be careful about that. Now, the second important point is that both these mutations, as well as the, the first one that I talked about, the 614, all of them are susceptible to control by the public health measures that we have used so far. Uh, however, given the greater transmission potential, we just need to work harder to achieve success. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and hand over to, to Nilika. 
uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I think uh, we should be very proud that we have a Sri Lankan expert who can express such uh, uh, technical uh, material in such a simple way that everyone can understand. Thank you very much once again, sir. There are many questions that are coming up, but we leave the questions to the end of the session. Now I call upon the, the chairperson, Dr. Sudat Samaravira, to invite our second guest speaker. Over to you, Sudat. Thank you, Hasid. Uh, let me introduce Professor Nilika Malavige. She is currently a professor in immunology and molecular medicine and also the director of the Center for Dengue Research, University of Sri Javadanapura. She is an academic visitor at MRC Human Immunology Unit of the University of Oxford and a member of the Executive Committee of the International Society of Infectious Diseases. She has been working on immunopathology and correlates of protection on dengue and now also works on immune response to SARS-CoV-2 and also that uh, she has sequenced the uh, COVID-19, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 which is existing in our country. Over to you, Professor Nilika Malarigi. Thank you, sir, for inviting me to uh, uh, talk about the Sri, Lan Sri Lankan situation, our viruses. Uh, so I'll be talking about our virus sequencing, a little bit of diagnostics, and uh, also talk about the, the, uh, about the vaccine and uh, uh, what, what we are doing with the vaccine. So um, just share my screen. Okay, so uh, as, as uh, everybody knows, we are uh, in the second wave and uh, it has been going on since early October and uh, it, it was increasing in intensity, but now I think it has sort of reached a plateau uh, as of now. And uh, so we have been uh, sequencing viruses from the beginning uh, for the reasons mentioned by Professor Malik. But of course, we have uh, not been doing uh, like, like the UK and, and uh, some other countries are doing. But at the same time, we have been doing uh, better than some other countries when it comes to sequencing. Uh, now, this is uh, the, the what we are doing as PCR is concerned in Sri Lanka. Uh, so currently about 12,000 uh, PCRs are done on average uh, and, and before this epidemic, as you can see, the daily average was like 2,000. So with the onset of the second wave, uh, the health ministry worked very hard, the epidemiology unit and everybody worked hard to increase our capacity, which is uh, around 17, uh, 12,000 plus or minus uh, right now. So we have a positivity rate of around 4.2%. Uh, so they, uh, one can argue that we need to really increase our testing capacity uh, to, to uh, find out exactly what is going on. But uh, depends on which countries we compare ourselves with. If we compare ourselves with countries like Bangladesh, which have the population of eight times as ours, their daily PCR testing is around 20,000. And even countries like the USA and Russia, uh, based on the population, we are uh, testing quite well. But if you compare ourselves with countries like Australia, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, and, and China, of course, we are not uh, doing similar uh, number of, of testing. But of course, uh, I think we are doing what we can uh, under the best circumstances. Uh, so just to highlight that point, now, uh, this is a family tree uh, of, of the sequences uh, com compared to the viral sequences present elsewhere in the world. So as I mentioned earlier, we started sequencing uh, from the uh, first patient uh, early March. And uh, because at that time, as you remember, we got so many individuals coming to Sri Lanka from Italy, South Korea, all over the world to escape the epidemics happening in those countries. So our viral strains uh, were we had different types of multi, uh, viral strains in March and early April. Uh, then we had a, a small outbreak compared to now in April in the CMC area, again, which was due to multiple strains, which is a spillover from uh, what was uh, 
brought into Sri Lanka from multiple origins in March. And, and then things were quiet uh, for a while. We had the Navy outbreak a little bit. Then we had a, a little bit of pay, uh, in patients coming from Middle East returnees. But the next significant thing we outbreak we had uh, was the Kandakadu outbreak, which, is, which was again contained. Uh, and then uh, things were pretty quiet for a complete two months where we did not have any uh, patient uh, locally transmitted uh, case reported. But then things changed early in October and this is the, uh, the viruses uh, where, where they are in the family tree compared to the rest of the viruses globally. And these blue dots are the early viral sequences in Sri Lanka. So one thing we wanted to find out, and I think everybody else uh, in the country were interested, is where did this uh, virus, virus come from? So this is the current strain. So one of the ideas was that uh, the Kandakadu outbreak occurred mid-July and went on till about uh, early August. So whether there were patients from the Kandakadu outbreak that went undetected and were in the community that led to the amino angoda outbreak. But as you can see, this is the viral strain of the Kandakadu outbreak, and this is the current virus. And when you look at this family tree, you can see that they are very, very distant relatives. Uh, so because of this very distance uh, relatedness between the Kandakadu virus and the current virus, uh, it is highly unlikely that, that this uh, Minuan border outbreak occurred because of uh, some this Kandakadu virus um, going undetected and going under, uh, underground. So it looks like the current virus did come from somewhere uh, due to uh, any uh, some problems in quarantine processes, uh, not, not only people coming from overseas, but uh, we could have got this, uh, not just quarantine. I mean, there are so many other ways that viruses can come to Sri Lanka uh, from uh, like the middle of the ocean, from illegal immigrants or immigrant uh, illegal things coming to Sri Lanka. Uh, so there are so many ways that viruses can come to Sri Lanka. So, but we can say that it is not related to the uh, Kandakadu uh, virus. Uh, and the other thing is like when, when uh, this outbreak started early October, uh, uh, during that time, there were so-called two clusters, the Minuangoda cluster and the uh, Paleogoda cluster. And so the other important thing is to understand was whether the Paleogoda cluster was a different outbreak from the Minuangoda cluster. And the viral sequencing told us and that the Paleogoda cluster and the Minuangoda cluster was because of the same virus. They're actually not two clusters, but just one cluster. So it's, it's actually uh, virologically, when you look at the sequences, it is wrong to call a Minuangoda cluster or a, a Paleogoda cluster. And, uh, those two, uh, two uh, clusters were due to the same virus, which originated, uh, uh, came to Sri Lanka sometime early September. Uh, so we have only been sequencing viruses up to end of November. We haven't sequenced our December vir viruses yet. So what we do is we, we sequence the viruses during that month at the end of the month. Uh, so we were supposed to do it this week, but because it's a little bit of a uh, holiday uh, and people are not around, we are planning to do our December sequences next week. But nevertheless, uh, so this is the family tree of the current sequences. And you can see that if all the viruses are related to each other very closely, so there were no introductions from new viruses uh, to Sri Lanka uh, end of November. But mind you, uh, all these viruses but that were included in, in this sequencing were from the Kalutara, Gampaha, and Colombo areas, and does not include any viruses uh, that are causing outbreaks in Jaffna and, and the northern region. So we don't know if the northern region outbreaks are due to different viruses. It is good to actually get those viruses and sequence them as well. Uh, so the ones uh, that are in boxes are the viruses that we have sequenced in November. And as you can see, uh, so I have shown some of the virus strains that we sequenced in, in uh, the early uh, Minongar outbreak. And you can see that the November uh, viruses have actually branched off or, or the children of, of the viruses that we sequenced in October. Uh, so it is the same virus that has been spreading up till end of November. Uh, I can only comment about if something else happened in December after we uh, sequenced the viruses in December uh, ne uh, next week. But another important thing is 
because of these uh, uh, mutation, emerging mutations from all over the world, and because we actually restarted tourism, we have decided that we will be here after sequencing viruses uh, every two weeks instead of once a month uh, and, and do much more sequencing than we are doing right now. And the WHO has very kindly agreed to fund us uh, with this initiative of sequencing more viruses and sequencing viruses every two weeks instead of on a monthly basis. Uh, now, the mutations in our strains, now Professor Malik uh, described uh, the 614G mutation, which is in the spike protein uh, leading to uh, transmission. So, uh, a large, nearly all the viruses, actually all the viruses in the current outbreak have this mutation that is associated with rapid spread, which is not surprising because most of, as he showed, most of the global viruses have been replaced, or initial virus has been replaced with this mutation. In our viruses, we saw this other mutation in the spike protein, but because it is not in a significant place, it is not going to uh, affect any of the uh, vaccine efficacy. The other mutations are not very significant, although you see it mainly in the non-structural proteins. So just to summarize, what we have found uh, as far as the molecular epidemiology of, of, of our viruses, uh, the current strain is different to the ones that were circulating before September. Uh, and it's the same strain that was circulating up to November. We don't know whether there were any more introductions after uh, end of November. And we have not, in, in our viruses, we did not have any significant mutations that affect the binding of neutralizing antibodies uh, that prevent the attachment of viruses. So currently, we don't have to worry about the current viruses. They would not affect uh, any uh, efficacy of any of the vaccines that are currently being rolled out. Now, a bit about diagnosis. Now, uh, there are one main method to uh, diagnose uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and uh, that is by PCR. And uh, Sri Lanka currently does uh, around 12,000 PCR, PCRs a day. And currently, we have 26 centers carrying out PCRs. We have also started doing antigen tests uh, and currently using two WHO-approved kits. And in future, I hope we will also have this lamp assay, which I'll just talk about it briefly. Uh, so the PCRs actually use a primers targeting two or three genes, uh, and everything has internal control. So most of the PCR kits in Sri Lanka target the N or F1 or E gene. So, and as, as Professor Malik said, the UK mutation and the uh, South African mutation has. Uh, affects the, the primers that target the S gene or the spike protein. So the current uh, PCR kits used in Sri Lanka do not have any issues with detection of this new uh, UK strain. In other words, because in media, I saw quite a lot of, uh, I mean, even in social media, uh, saying that uh, the, the PCR kits in Sri Lanka uh, will become negative with the UK strain, which is not true, uh, because most of our PCR kits issued by the MSD target N, O, R, F, and E gene, there is no issue in uh, detecting uh, the new UK strain uh, using those kits. Uh, and, uh, but there are certain PCR kits. Now, uh, this is an example, this TechPath PCR kit, which has three targets. And in that PCR kit, uh, there is one primer target in the S gene or the spike protein. So because of this mutation in the spike protein in the UK strain, when you use a, a kit that targets three genes, including the S gene, then this S gene gives a false negative result. So this can be used as a screening test to see if, if, uh, is, if, if a patient is infected with this new UK strain. Because if you uh, do the PCR on, on a sample, and if all three genes are working, it means it's unlikely to be this new UK strain and it is used as a screening test. So again, I saw in, in the newspapers and also quite a lot of uh, journalists were calling me today uh, because somebody has said that the two patients from UK had been tested in our lab. And uh, some media said that they did have the mutation. Some media said that it didn't have the mutation. So basically, uh, if to confirm whether there's mutation or not, you have to do sequencing. But if you do a PCR and, and you can detect uh, all three genes, it, is, it means that it is unlikely to be 
uh, that new UK strain and the samples from UK patients sent to us so far, uh, all three genes have been working, which means that so far the samples sent to us uh, do not seem to be from this new UK strain. Now about the antigen kits, uh, now the antigen kits detect viral antigen. Uh, so you have to get, an, uh, get a respiratory sample, a nasopharyngeal swab for the antigen kit. Uh, some some uh, media was uh, mentioning that actually you do it with a blood test. Uh, you do the dengue antigen testing with blood, but here the uh, virus is, uh, is in your respiratory secretion. So in that case, you have to take a respiratory sample to do, uh, to do the antigen test. Uh, it, the sensitivity uh, is high when there are high viral loads. So the antigen test picks up patients, most patients with high viral load and therefore who are infectious. Uh, but the thing with more, most of these rapid antigen tests is you have to read it on time. If you don't read it on time, you get a positive band at the test uh, there. So let's say if you have to, uh, for instance, this Abbott uh, kit we are, which is being used in Sri Lanka, you have to read it in 15 minutes. Instead of 15 minutes, if you read it at 20, 25 minutes, you get a faint band, uh, which you might interpret as a positive, uh, and that is not actual positive, but a false positive because of delayed reading. Now, these things can happen when you are doing a, a large scale a rapid antigen test, uh, I don't know, by the roadside or somewhere else, and, and you have a, a maybe like 30, 40 rapid antigen tests uh, in a row, and you keep doing them, and then you take time to read the first one or the second one, and, and then you might get this uh, false, uh, negative, uh, false negative band. Uh, so it's important to read this uh, rapid antigen test at the right time. This is not something to do with the rapid antigen test for SARS-CoV-2. It is also, we also see this with the dengue NS1 antigen test. If you leave it for too long, you get a band. And this, uh, finally, uh, coming to the lab assay, this is actually a molecular diagnostic test and usually take 10, uh, 30 minutes. Uh, you can visually detect it uh, by the appearance of fluorescence, or you can use a real-time PCR machine and you can look at the curves as we do uh, with the conventional PCR. So a highly sensitive and specific lamp assay has been developed by Slintech in Sri Lanka and was evaluated in our lab and also has been evaluated at MRI, been evaluated at the IDH lab and the Karapidia lab. And so far they have said that it is looking very promising. So hopefully if we have this test as well rolled out uh, because it, it's much, uh, the short, shorter to do the test and it's cheaper, uh, we can increase our test capacity, especially at airports, uh, to, to rapidly do this test. And coming to vaccines. Uh, now, uh, we got good news today that the AstraZeneca vaccine was approved uh, by the UK authorities and will be used in UK soon. Uh, now, there's a lot of concern whether uh, shortcuts were taken and proper procedures were not followed when vaccines were manufactured. Uh, so there are a lot of conspiracy theories going, uh, going around. Uh, the usual vaccine manufacturing process, you have a preclinical stage where the vaccine is developed uh, in, and the animal studies are done. Then you have a, a phase one, you finish it, uh, submit the data, you have a phase two, finish it, then the phase three, and then only uh, you have the regulatory uh, authorities approving it and then manufacturing process happening. But all of us know that we are in a pandemic situation. So you don't sit and wait uh, for years and years till uh, you, know, you know what is going on in the world. So everything has to be done uh, very in a hurried manner, but not taking shortcuts. So the preclinical stage had already happened for most vaccines. The mRNA vaccines were not, not, not new. The viral vector vaccine in Oxford, they had already done it for the SARS-CoV-1 virus. So here they just shifted to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, here what happened was each phase was overlapped with the other phases. So while the phase one was going on, the phase two started. And while the phase two was going on, then the phase three started. And with the phase three, the manufacturing process started as well. So, so the manufacturing companies were taking a huge risk because by the end of the uh, phase three, if the vaccine was found to be ineffective, then all the production would have gone to waste. And I think this happened to one vaccine in Australia. There are 
that vaccine was shown to give false net, uh, positive HIV uh, antibody uh, test. And uh, so then um, with the submission of uh, then all the regulatory authorities, look at the safety data, the efficacy data after the phase three trial is finished and uh, give the regulatory appro approvals. So in this case, uh, all the regulatory approvals will be emergency use, uh, which is currently being given. Uh, so now there are several types of vaccines being used. Uh, one platform is these viral vectors, uh, which is done by uh, the Ox uh, developed by Oxford and rolled out by AstraZeneca. Then the Sputnik V vaccine developed by Gamalia Institute in Russia. So these viral vector vac vaccines are stored at two to eight degrees and relatively cheaper. The mRNA vaccines are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. These require ultra cold storage. Uh, uh, the Pfizer needing minus 70 and the Moderna needing minus 20. Uh, so these two vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, have been approved by FDA, uh, European Medical Authority, and several other countries. And these are relatively more expensive than the viral vector vaccines. So just to update what happens with the viral vector vaccines here, uh, this is an example of the Oxford vaccine. The Russian vaccine is similar. Uh, so uh, what, what happens here is that uh, you take uh, adenovirus, which is a respiratory virus, and insert the gene of the SARS-CoV-2, which, which in this case is the spike protein, and then uh, and you take a non-replicating replicating virus. So when you inject this virus, uh, the, it is a non-replicating virus, it will infect the cells, but the viral will not, not replicate, and the viral uh, protein are transcribed, and in this case, the spike protein is transcribed and you get an immune response to the virus. Uh, and uh, the mRNA vaccines, you have the mRNA, which is against the spike protein in this uh, nanoparticle, uh, like, like protein nanoparticle, you inject it into the cell and the mRNA is translated in a ribosome expressed and you get a immune, uh, both the antibody and a T cell response. Now, the important questions are who gets the vaccine and when. Uh, if you look at the history of infectious diseases, uh, we have had a, a, a epidemics of smallpox, which is no longer there. Then measles, uh, mumps, rubella, uh, the, the congenital rubella, all of those are not are no longer to be seen, polio. So there, there have been a lot of infectious diseases which have completely been wiped off or actually suppressed because of vaccination. And this is a real, uh, one of the biggest achievements. So, but in this case, because we need to, uh, the, the supply and demand uh, is, is not matched, we'll have to choose who to give the vaccine to. And of course, uh, when you get COVID, we know the risk factors of those who get severe COVID, uh, though they are those with comorbidities like diabetes, cancers, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, and, and old individuals. So, and healthcare workers who are at the front line of treating these uh, patients. So uh, the vaccines should be rolled out. And I think that's what Sri Lanka has decided to uh, immunize these vulnerable groups first, the old individuals, those with com comorbidities and healthcare workers, and uh, how many and the proportion will depend on the availability of vaccines, the funds, and, uh, and the availability of cold storage facilities. Because we do have cold storage facilities uh, uh, for, for the usual temperatures, but if you're going for uh, vaccines with which require ultra cold temperatures, then we will have to have uh, those storage facilities in place uh, very rapidly in order to get down those vaccines like the Pfizer vaccine. And of course, we have a lot of questions about the vaccine uh, as, as in how long the immunity lasts for. Uh, because now, uh, there are instances where there are reports of reinfection uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, especially in those who have had mild infection. So in that case, will vaccines provide long lasting immunity? And if so, how long for? Uh, and the current vaccine trials have, uh, have uh, evaluated disease severity as an endpoint. So all three vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and, and Oxford vaccine, uh, are the, the efficacy rate is over 90%. The Oxford low dose followed by high dose are with 90%. They are very effective in preventing severe disease. Uh, and symptomatic infection, which is extremely good news. Uh, but of course, they don't, we don't know uh, whether they prevent transmission or how the proportion of individuals who get 
needs to be taken in illness. Then, of course, there was uh, there is this worry about anaphylaxis occurring with the Pfizer vaccine, uh, especially in those who have had severe allergies. But uh, that doesn't make that anybody with severe allergies should all those with severe allergies should be excluded from getting the vaccine. I was contacted by one of our uh, doctors in the UK yesterday who got the Pfizer vaccine. He had refractory several episodes of refractory anaphylaxis for food, but after evaluation, he got the vaccine yesterday and and he is completely all right. So you have to uh, evaluate these things, and uh, of course, if you if you don't have long lasting immunity. And if you can only immunize a proportion of individuals, uh, will we have to give these vaccines on a yearly basis to high-risk vulnerable groups as we are doing with the influenza vaccine now? And lastly, what would be the impact of emerging strains? Now, we know that for influenza vaccine, we have a new influenza vaccine every year because the influenza uh, virus, which is again RNA virus, is changing rapidly. So you have to make a new uh, influenza vaccine based on the strains every year. So will the SARS-CoV-2 virus ultimately go to that uh, by uh, by mutations, uh, significant mutations resulting? Uh, in the vaccine is not working. So these are some of the questions we need to think about and, and some of the questions only time will uh, tell us. So, uh, and there's a discussion whether we actually do need a vaccine uh, and and uh, because if it doesn't completely stop transmission. But we know in Sri Lanka, the problem we are having, uh, we, are, we are a developing country with uh, economy not doing so good and this uh, cost of COVID is enormous. We are closing, apart from the cost on the economy, the closure of schools and universities. We don't have online facilities. Our children, our university students can't do our, their educational activities uh, in, in the current status. And of course, the cost of PCRs, COVID-related costs uh, associated quarantine, ICU care, hospital care, transport of COVID-infected uh, individuals to healthcare facilities, uh, uh, feeding them, feeding the individuals in isolated areas. So there's a huge cost involved. So it is very important to have a, a good vaccine as soon as possible, because when you look at the cost benefit ratio, uh, apart from the health significance, this has a huge economical benefit as well. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, we have to, uh, it's important to understand the, how transmission occurs, occurs properly to, in order to take the proper preventive measures. And what important thing that I think it is very obvious to everybody uh, who is witnessing this epidemic, uh, which started from January itself, is that myths seem to be do, doing more harm than the epidemic itself. So the WHO has a separate website uh, as, as a myth, myth busters, because there's a huge problem of infodemics and myths, uh, especially circulating in social media and a safe and effective vaccine is the way forward. Uh, so I'll stop there and, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nilika. <clears throat> Thank you very much for very clearly expressing the science behind many things. I think uh, the time is right for us to have a quick uh, discussion, a question and answer session uh, to Begin proceedings, I would invite Dr. Nihala Besingha, the President of the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka, and Dr. Uh, Sudat Samarabira uh, to initiate deliberations. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Hasita, and, and thank you very much, Professor Malik Rial Piris and Professor Malavige, that um, interesting and very ex excellent uh, presentation that you shared uh, for the, the, the people who have joined this webinar. And I can see that. Uh, more than 500 people are, have joined our webinar. So I'm sure that uh, people are waiting for to ask questions. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, I mean, to begin with uh, Professor Malik Piris, that uh, uh, one is that uh, now, uh, is the, uh, for both, uh, both of you, I think probably can answer that. Uh, is there a mechanism that, uh, that uh, uh, this sharing of these mutations, uh, this gene sequencing, uh, uh, I mean, what is uh, learned from uh, the, at least in the countries that which are very connected to uh, another country. So uh, is there a, a particular mechanism? Uh, 
uh, I'll ask another question also that uh, there was an article today about, I mean, sharing uh, in among our circles that from the Center for Evidence-Based uh, Medicine, that uh, it say, uh, there was a discussion about this paper about whether the virus can get into water and then whether the whether what there whether there is a transmission through uh, the soil and whether it get to get into the uh, you know i mean uh, the soil and then uh, come back to the the humans uh, after some time so i would like uh, professor malik prishal uh, peris to answer these questions first and then uh, i think uh, others can probably uh, dr sudar samaravira can uh, join and others also can join uh, asking questions from the two speakers. Over to you, uh, Professor Malik Sial, please. Uh, thank you, Nihal. So I, I will I will leave the, the sequence sharing question to Neelika because uh, I'm sure she's quite familiar with that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll maybe address your second question. And I have also seen this paper. And indeed, I, um, you know, uh, took the liberty of, uh, of analyzing that in detail. So, um, Oh, sorry. Hold on. What I will do is, um, if you, if I can just share my screen again, I have uh, just a few points to make, and I think these are important not just for this particular issue, but you know, in in general. I, I hope you can see my screen now. So I think uh, this is the paper you are talking about. Um, they say risk of SARS coronavirus infection from contaminated water systems. Uh, now, uh, first and foremost, um, again, I think some of the emails I saw it being mentioned that it's a Oxford paper uh, from the University of Oxford. That is not the case. If, if you look at this, you, you can see that uh, this is not University of Oxford. Um, it was commented on by a website uh, at the University of Oxford. So the scientists are not from University of Oxford. Now, there's another very important point, and, and again, I'm pointing this out because these are uh, not just for this paper, but uh, things that you need to be aware about. So when you look at this paper, you can see that it is online, posted on June 20th, 2020, right? Now, you might, um, uh, you prob I, I hope you realize that particularly during this COVID outbreak, people have been posting articles online. There is this uh, server, uh, this uh, med archive, where any of you can write anything more or less and post it there and, and they will post it. It doesn't mean that it has been peer reviewed. It doesn't mean it has been checked. So what is interesting is it was posted in June, but it is still not published in a scientific journal. So what this means is for six months, I mean, normally it would have been submitted to a scientific journal. It would have gone through peer review and been published. So. When you see that, you already need to be careful. Okay, but let's look at the data. But now, I must also point out that this med archive, this rapid publications online is extremely useful because people do publish very quickly, very useful data. But the only thing is, if it is not being accepted by a peer reviewed journal, you have to be careful. The reader has to be careful and check, right? You can't assume that what they say is true. So let's, let's look at this paper. So they say that um, we aim to assess the survivability of SARS coronavirus within water systems and uh, using modeling estimations. So uh, it's basically a, a modeling paper. They have not directly demonstrated presence of live water in water systems, nor have they for that matter even done PCR in water systems. So this is purely a modeling paper. They, they, they looked at um, analysis to calculate dilution factor in any contamination that may get into the river system. Um, and then they made various assumptions in terms of how much of infectious virus there may be in the stool, the feces of people. And then also assumptions about if this sewage uh, spills over through some faulty sewage system or whatever into the water supply. And that's basically their whole study is based on, on that, those assumptions, right? And then, of course, what is striking is they claim that um, you may have infectious virus for up to 25 days. Now, again, if you look carefully, the up to 25 days is at 4 degrees centigrade. 
that is the temperature you get in a fridge or you may get in Norway. Uh, that is not the temperature you get in Sri Lanka. Even if you look at their own data, at say 20 degrees temperature uh, centigrade of, of water, the estimated survival, even according to their own data, is less than one day. And I will show you the data here. So, okay, so this is this is from their paper, right? Um, so this is at um, at four degrees, according to their modeling. Yes, it survives for a long time. At 20 degrees, less than one day, more than 50% is gone. So this is even according to their data. But then there are some major problems in their assumptions. So they assume that the, the, the ratio between a PCR gene copy and infectious virus is one to 10, meaning 10 PCR copies is equal to one infectious virus or one to 100 or one to 1000. They, they make three, three levels of assumption. But in reality, what we and many other people have shown is that it is close to one in one million. So in that parameter, they are off by a factor of 1,000 to 100,000. Then they assume that the minimal infection dose is 100. In reality, the best estimates now are in the order of 1,000. So another factor, error factor of 10. Now, even if you just multiply the lower error factor by this one, already the estimates are off by a factor of 10,000 fold or up to a million fold. So I just make the point that, you know, we, we really need to be careful when we look particularly at these non peer reviewed publications before we jump to conclusions. But having, having said all that, I mean, I think we do need to be careful about disposal of sewage because virus uh, in, in COVID patients, virus is shed in the stool. Um, and if there is gross direct contamination of water supplies, there could be some concern, but it's not just for COVID. I mean, obviously, if you do have that, there are many other problems that we would be concerned about, uh, you know, hepatitis A, uh, so many other things. Um, now, this type of risk that they're talking about, and indeed, even in their paper, they are not talking about the type of sewage that we have in Sri Lanka, where, except say in Colombo, where you have central sewerage system, and now in Kandy, it's just beginning to be rolled out. Most parts of Sri Lanka, what we have is soakage pits. So the, the feces goes into a soakage pit and the, the material has to then seep through the soil before it can get into any water system, right? So during that process, which will take quite a time, the virus gets filtered, the virus is dying all the time. Um, and the risk I would say from soakage pit latrines is, is, is negligible. But clearly if you have some major problem, say I'm not familiar with the sewerage system in Colombo, but if for some reason, you know, it <laughs> directly un unloads into some ma major water uh, supply, that would be very undesirable, not just for COVID, but for many other things. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, the other corollary, because I do see many questions also uh, in the chat. So linking this to the burial issue, uh, I just said there is no risk of contaminating, I mean, feces from infected people whom where we know there is virus in, in the feces, particularly in the early stage of illness. Uh, going through soakage pits, going through the soil and getting into the water table, uh, there is no risk. If there is no risk from there, there can also be no risk from burying, uh, uh, you know, bodies. Again, you don't bury the body in water. So again, you have the soil that has to be filtered through. There is physical filtration. There is virus inactivation going on during that process. So you can't have a risk with one and not have a risk with the other. So I think I will, I will end there, but I think I just want to make one final point. Coming back to this paper, the, the problem that these people have, I'm sure they are, they are, their water science is pretty good. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not an expert. I cannot check that part of their study, but I'm pretty, I, 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 I assume that those calculations are good. So they are good water scientists. They may be good geologists, but if you are just a good water scientist or a geologist, but you don't have 
a good understanding of infectious disease, of virology, and con how you control contagious diseases, then you can get into very big, uh, get, get into very wrong conclusions. So with that, I, I will end. I will leave Neelika to address uh, the other question. But if you have any other follow-up questions, I'll be happy to address it. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Neelika, over to you. You can uh, address yes. the next question that was. Yeah. So I think the next question was whether the sequences are being shared between countries and uh, whether our sequences are available. It, it, I, I think I got the question right. So uh, there, is, there are several websites uh, which share the sequences. One, the most popular website is a website called Next Train, where uh, almost all countries uh, are actually depositing their sequences. And uh, there are more than 70,000 or 80,000 sequences from all over the world currently uh, deposited there. So you can analyze even our all our sequences are also deposited there. So you can compare your sequences with the global sequences, regional sequences with India, neighboring countries, and also do mutational analysis of your sequences and sequences of other countries uh, and uh, do any sort of analysis. Thank you. Masita, over to you and uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, le let me invite one of the the, the chat box uh, uh, requests. I think Professor Rajita Vikramasinghe has raised his hand. I would now invite uh, Rajita to ask his question. Uh, can the coordinator unmute Professor Rajita Vikramasinghe? Over to you, Professor Rajita. So until Professor Rajita comes on board, uh, let me pose another question, which has appeared in, in some of the chat that I've seen. Uh, the question in summary is like this. Is there a safety net where tropical nations like ours can rely on natural considerations, like the sunlight, probably what it means is about natural vitamin D, and high daytime temperature? And also, uh, there were some uh, concerns about uh, consideration, uh, considerations about BCG vaccination, whether it has any implications. Professor Piris, we would be uh, appreciative if you can just uh, touch on those three areas uh, about uh, the sunlight being a consideration uh, and vitamin D and about uh, the daytime temperature, the high temperature in, in tropical nations and about the childhood BCG vaccination, whether it has any implications towards uh, respiratory virus of this, this nature. Over to you, sir. Yes, yeah, so um, in, indeed we have done some studies where we looked at virus survival uh, on surfaces at different temperatures and humidities. And what we can see is that um, at low temperature, low humidity settings, which is what you find in say air conditioned rooms, or like in most uh, temperate countries, right? In the UK and, and um, uh, Europe and places like that. The virus survival is much better. It stays alive much longer, which means the chance for transmission is greater. Whereas in higher temperature, high humidity conditions, closer to what we have say in Colombo, the survival in the environment is much shorter. So that possibly may give us some advantage, meaning the force of transmission may be a bit less. Um, what I'm talking about just now, the work we did was on surfaces. Uh, we don't know whether in the air, when, when somebody, uh, as you know, uh, because when you contaminate surfaces, somebody touches the surface and touches their eyes, nose or mouth, you can get, get yourself infected, right? So uh, shorter survival on surfaces, uh, may mean slightly less transmission. We don't know whether this also impacts the same effect will be there 
on in, on the airborne virus. That uh, data is not available. Um, now, other than that, in regard to BCG, and I think uh, Nilika can comment on this as well. Uh, there are some basic immunological principles that do seem to suggest that a live vaccine like BCG may provide some broad protection, not just against TB, but against um, many things, bacteria and viruses, for a period of time. Uh, now, in fact, there are clinical trials that are going on. It started in Australia to exactly look at that, but clinical trial data are not out. But to my understanding, what even theoretically is being considered is relatively recent BCG vaccination having this effect on what is called trained immunity. Not if you were vaccinated as a child, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that it would have any effect at all. Uh, that is not what is being, uh, uh, you know, even proposed by the people who are doing the clinical trial in Australia. I mean, I heard, I heard him giving a talk and he specifically said that that is not what they believe is going to happen. Now, of course, because of this, uh, a whole lot of other people have started to look at the geographic areas of the world where there's BCG vaccination, there's no BCG vaccination. And of course, some, some time ago, earlier in the year, they, they thought that um, the areas that were having big outbreaks was um, places like US and UK where there is no routine BCG vaccination, whereas places like Sri Lanka, India, at that time, India did not have many cases. But of course, we know that doesn't hold true. So I, I don't uh, really believe that the fact that we were vaccinated by BCG as children is going to protect us. Uh, vitamin D is always good, but um, you know, uh, I'm not sure whether we can rely on that <laughs> completely. So I think the short answer to your question is yes, maybe we may have some reduction in risk, but as you can see, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we certainly do have very efficient transmission. I mean, uh, you know, if we, you might argue that uh, the Minuangoda cluster may have taken place in air conditioned environments. I don't know the exact context of, of their, you know, that factory and, and where they eat and all this stuff. But uh, certainly the, the Paleogoda uh, explosion uh, of transmission was uh, not in low humid, low, um, uh, low, low, um, sorry, uh, low temperature environments, uh, although of course the, the presence of a lot of ice probably contributed to the survival of the virus for much longer in that situation. So again, I don't think we can, uh, there may be some slight uh, hope we can get from that, but I certainly would not um, you know, relax and, and hope for the sun and the weather to save us from COVID. Uh, I'm much more hopeful about Nilika's vaccines. Over. Thank you, sir. Nilika, uh, I think you can add a few uh, words yes. to it, but there, before you do that, there are two questions. Uh, one is about uh, using soap and sanitizer. Can we trust soap and sanitizer is one part of the question. On the other side, there are a few people asking whether washing hands too often can, can take away the good pathogens, uh, I mean, good, good uh, uh, microorganisms from our hands and uh, the surface of the, our hands. And could that cause problems uh, if, we do, if you do that uh, on the long run? So uh, you can take over those questions together. What do you? Yes. Uh, so just to uh, end, end on the BCG, uh, so for other viral infections, not childhood BCG vaccination, but as Professor Malik said, uh, what they're trying to do is uh, whether vaccinate, giving the BCG vaccine currently will have an effect on uh, immunity to SARS-CoV-2. So the BCG vaccination has shown to protect on long, short term, uh, uh, disease severity of viral infections like influenza, uh, but not, not during the long term. Now coming to soap and hand sanitizers, if you do uh, use soap properly, we can trust soap uh, because a, a soap is a standard thing that, that is provided that you wash your hands properly. About hand sanitizers, uh, now, that depends on whether the hand sanitizers actually contain what they're supposed to contain, uh, which is 70% of alcohol. So if you don't, if, if the hand sanitizers do contain 70% of alcohol, we can rely on them. 
but the question is, uh, we, uh, that, that is assuming that they have uh, that, that percentage of alcohol. The other question is, if, if will, will they take the good bacteria away? Actually, uh, as an immunologist, I have seen patients, uh, quite a few patients recently, uh, uh, because of hand sanitizer use, I believe, or using harsh types of soap, uh, that they have got uh, eczema and contact them. Uh, it's mainly eczema of their hands uh, and uh, having uh, some reactions. So in susceptible individuals who, who are susceptible to have eczema, uh, prolonged uh, and frequent hand washing with harsh soaps, and uh, frequent use of hand sanitizers may give rise to eczema. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nilika. Thank you, Professor yes, Nilika. Uh, Professor Rajita, over to you. You can raise your question uh, now. Uh, uh, unmuted. Okay. Yes. Uh, right. So I have uh, two questions to Professor Malik and one to Nilika. Uh, first thing is, Professor Malik Piri said that we should be doing genotyping and that information should be used to uh, say that cluster uh, we have a cluster transmission now we have been loosely saying that transmission in sri lanka is uh, cluster transmission and in a sense we have i don't know whether for whatever reason we are saying this without any scientific evidence because there is no scientific evidence to suggest that it is not community spread either. The second question to Prof. Manik here is, will there be a public health dividend of giving only one dose of the vaccine to people and uh, giving the second dose so that you cover a greater proportion of the population? And then the question to Prof. Neelika is, uh, is the, what is the sensitivity of PCR? If it is not 100%, we have to accept the fact that there is going to be transmission that is going to be missed, which Thank we you. are not uh, Thank addressing. You, Thank you, Prof. Yeah, we have the question. Let me add a few uh, things to it because there are a few additional areas that has been in the chat box. Uh, also, there is a concern uh, about the public health implication of asymptomatic and symptomatic transmission. I think uh, that's an area that we have to address uh, during this discussion. And also, uh, will, the, will there be an opportunity for transmission interruption, uh, meaning zero transmission at any point? Can any country achieve a zero transmission through these public health measures that we are advancing on? And also the, the implication of using the vaccine or multiple vaccines at a way to achieve uh, such interruption of transmission. These are some of the questions that were added on. Uh, over to you, Prof, first, and then Prof Zanilika. Right, so the, the first question was about uh, the use of sequencing and um, uh, in epidemiology in terms of identifying you know, whether clusters are linked. So that is exactly what I think Nilika showed, you know, showing that, for example, that the Minuangoda cluster and the Paleogoda cluster are basically the same virus that had an explosion in Minuangoda and then trickled along and had another explosion in Paleogoda, right? So so that that is exactly the use of uh, genetic sequencing because otherwise, you know, one would never have been sure whether the Paleogoda cluster was caused by a separate introduction. So, so I think you know that is exactly what is being achieved. Um, now, regarding the question of giving one dose, I think that would be extremely risky because um, the, I mean, I, I understand the, the theoretical. You know, on, on the one hand, you could argue that if you have a limited amount of vaccine, why not give uh, one dose to be more people than to give two doses? Um, to a smaller number of people, half, half the people. Uh, but so it is true that from the data, say with the Pfizer vaccine, there is evidence that with the single dose, with the first dose, not a single dose, with the first dose, already there was about 50% protection. But with the second dose, then that protection goes up to, to, to 95% or whatever it is. Um, I, I think it would be quite 
risky to 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 try to spread this thin by giving one dose to more people uh, is is my 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 feeling and and also keep in mind just as nilika pointed out all these vaccine efficacy data that we are seeing now is coming based on prevention of symptomatic disease we don't know how effective it is on transmission so even though the one dose did have some effect on disease i'm talking about the pfizer vaccine uh, would it have any effect on transmission we don't even know whether two doses have an effect on transmission so i i think i think we should um, really go with the with the with the license recommendations for these vaccines very briefly about asymptomatic transmission uh, is transmission from asymptomatic people yes i mean th there is plenty of evidence that Asymptomatic, well, first and foremost, pre-symptomatic people are extremely good at transmitting. Pre-symptomatic meaning these are the people in the late incubation period before they develop symptoms, uh, transmitting about 40%, 45% of all transmission takes place in that pre-symptomatic phase, right? So that is no question. But the question is, what about those people who are asymptomatic and always asymptomatic, they never develop symptoms? There are plenty of examples of such people transmitting. What is not so clear is whether they are as transmissible, as infectious as, say, mild uh, symptomatic cases. Um, and uh, that is quite difficult to answer. But the, the information that we have at the moment is that the asymptomatic people are somewhat less infectious, but not a huge amount less. So you know, maybe a factor of two or something lower, but uh, you really have to be careful of asymptomatic infection as well as pre-symptomatic infection, as well as symptomatic infection. So I think, um, well, I mean, the question of zero transmission, so maybe I'll, I'll leave Nilika to address it and, and if necessary, I can come back on that. Over to Nilika. I think I'll answer the question about the PCR the sensitivity. Uh, now, the PCR sensitivity uh, in, in studies has been shown to be around 70%. That's the overall sensitivity. Uh, but if, if you do a PCR at the early onset of illness, where the viral loads are higher, then the PCR sensitivity would be higher. But as, as time goes by, because the uh, viral load declines, the PCR sensitivity ca ca can, can be less. So the 70% sensitivity is the overall sensitivity. Uh, so that it's higher during early illness and uh, as time goes by, uh, and on not, not just with the viral load, it can uh, uh, vary uh, based on how the sample is taken, how good the person takes the sample, and also the time taken to reach the lab. If, if uh, let's say 200, 300 samples are taken, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, uh, because of high temperatures, the viability of the virus declines. Uh, so uh, then by the time it comes to the lab, there'll be less virus uh, for the PCR to become positive. So all these factors come in. So the important thing is if there's a patient with very suggestive symptoms of COVID, if the PCR is negative, it is important to repeat it. Uh, so, so that is, uh, so, but if, if you're just doing one cross-sectional study uh, of just doing PCRs and if it's negative, uh, the, uh, you, you can actually miss uh, individuals because of this PCR sensitivity issue. No test is 100% sensitive. Uh, and coming to the question about zero transmission, uh, I, I don't know whether I'm in mean, Taiwan and countries actually with extensive testing, uh, uh, closing their borders for a very long time, achieve zero transmission. Uh, Australia also with uh, testing uh, and millions and millions of population after detecting a single case, it go to zero transmission, but not really. I mean, they, they have cases again. So, uh, so I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and certain countries, maybe like Taiwan, can afford zero transmission because most of the production uh, does happen within the country and they, and they actually contained it very early, closed the borders and that was it. Uh, but uh, what we can do in a country like ours, given the extent of the spread that we are seeing right now, uh, I don't know. I think uh, uh, Professor Malik uh, would like to add, add uh, to, the, to that question. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I think probably zero transmission may not be something that we, I mean, I'm, I hope we can achieve it, but I, I I suspect that will be 
quite challenging for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, because as you can see, the virus is also undergoing some mutations, right? I think what I personally would be very happy with is basically if we can protect against severe disease, particularly in the high risk and the vulnerable groups, and then extend it to, to all pop the whole population. If we can be protected from severe disease, then we convert COVID-19 to be something like um, the common cold coronaviruses. Uh, I would be quite happy with that outcome. Uh, now, um, you know, uh, Anyway, I, I think I will leave it like that because, as I say, you know, I don't think the virus is going to stay still uh, and uh, and uh, not do anything. Uh, so, so it, it will be quite challenging. Over. Yeah, if I can add something, just just one sentence, Hasita. Now, with the vaccine, if we can actually uh, vaccinate all the vulnerable and high risk population, and we get rid of severe illness. Uh, and, and, and mortality, then it will be like another common cold. And if there is widespread transmission of a common cold, we don't really have to worry about it because everybody gets a common cold. So with the vaccine, if we can reduce disease severity and there is no severe disease or, or because we, right now we are doing all these things because we are uh, because of the mortality and the high morbidity associated with COVID. But if we get rid of the mortality and morbidity, severe illness, then, then uh, I think so many get, every, we all get uh, at least one common cold a year, more than that actually. So in that case, uh, it will be all right. Thank you. Thank you, Nilika. Uh, Sudat, do you have any questions uh, to any other pa two panelists? Over to you, Sudat. Yeah, that Professor Nilika has uh, that uh, expressed about the reservations about this uh, rapid antigen test when you are doing in bulk and uh, that can give in the false positive that you know that in uh, the current uh, context that uh, we are using rapid antigen test in certain instances and that it is been now it is a close that uh, slowly transforming into a screening test people are going into the laboratory and doing the test and to see whether they are positive or negative so what is the your opinion on that that uh, what is the use it and what is the abuse of it uh, this rapid antigen test yes i i think the guidelines have been uh, very clear on when to use the rapid antigen test but i think people are not aware of the guidelines or uh, actually because it's much easier to do than a pcr they are trying to uh, basically not replacing pcr with antigen test but as i said one uh, important thing is if you do like 100 rapid antigen tests in a row uh, uh, you can in any rapid antigen test you do get a small band coming up if you are not if you don't read it at the right time so then that is a false positive and in the context of a country like sri lanka if somebody gets a positive we know that the person is going to be taken into a treatment center and if the person doesn't actually have covid the person is exposed to other pa patients who actually do have covid and there's a huge problem there so it's, it's careful that we are uh, uh, otherwise the actual uh, since specificity of the antigen test is exactly the same as PCR. It doesn't give false positives. It's just that uh, error in the reading. The other question is whether we are doing uh, using the rapid antigen test rationally. Uh, and uh, if somebody has symptoms, a symptomatic patient coming with COVID-like symptoms, that is not when you actually do rapid antigen test. If it's in contact tracing where uh, that we know in a high risk area. So if, if the prevalence of COVID in a particular area is high, then for contact tracing, uh, you can uh, use rapid antigen test. But in an area where there is low prevalence, when you do a rapid antigen test, there is a thing called the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. So because of that, you may get uh, erroneous results. I would like uh, to uh, Professor Malik to, add, uh, to uh, do any clarifications on that, please. <clears throat> No, I, I, I agree with uh, what Nilika said, and, I, and I, I would just like to add one or two things. So, I mean, there are some nice studies done in, uh, for example, in Mexico, where they, they evaluated uh, these uh, antigen tests on about seven or eight different centers, right? And what they saw was that training, I mean, the rapid antigen test may look very simple, uh, but uh, of course it is much simpler than PCR for sure, but what they found was that training of the people who are doing it is 
very important to get reliable results. Just as Neelika pointed out one example about the, the, the time uh, that you read the results and otherwise you get false positive results, etc. So I think I completely agree with that. And, and I also uh, agree with the, with the, with the um, point that she made about when you are using even a highly specific test in a low prevalence setting, you are going to get false positives. So if you are using it in a low prevalence setting, it would be very advisable, at least for a period of time, to, to check these positives with PCR. I mean, all you have to do is to, when you, when you have a positive antigen test, take another swab and send it for PCR. I mean, you, you, you handle the person in whatever way you want, but at least over a week, you will know whether you are having you know problems because of the low prevalence situation. So I think, yeah, th these are things that probably we need to pay attention to. Over. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I think the time is 8.30 here in, in Sri Lanka and many other people who are probably listening to this uh, uh, webinar, which is very interesting from the east are nearing midnight. Uh, I think we will probably short to one or two have been asked around the animals, particularly the living pets and the animals, uh, the probability of animals transmitting the virus, probably animals getting it first and then transmit it to humans. And also the dead carcasses, the dispo this, uh, disposition of the dead carcasses, whether the uh, dead carcasses, if they are buried, could that be a, a mechanism for the transmission of this COVID, new SARS-CoV virus to humans? In, in a uh, later date, uh, is uh, these were appearing in the, the 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 chat box. So I'll just combine everything together, and I would like both of you to just answer that question uh, for the benefit of the viewers. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so uh, indeed, some domestic pets can get infected from infected patients, like cats and dogs. Uh, indeed, we were the first to report uh, in Hong Kong that dogs can get infected uh, and then cats can get infected from cases. But uh, neither dogs or cats have been really shown to be a major problem in terms of sustaining transmission and then spilling back to humans. But then, of course, there are other animals that are farmed like mink, uh, which are farmed for these mink coats. And they are extremely susceptible to infection. And that is why there have been outbreaks in the Netherlands, in, in Spain, and of course, more recently in Denmark. So millions of minks, I mean, 15 million minks were killed because of this uncontrolled outbreak. And from the infected mink, there was transmission back to humans, right? Not from buried mink. This was from the mink in the farms when they were infected. And of course, the people who were working there and they gave the infection to the minks. And then from the minks, there was infection of other people. Then, of course, I know there's also been a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, chat about this burial of 15 million mink, mind you. <laughs> All right. 15 million mink buried in a fairly limited uh, area of land. And what do you expect? I mean, buried in shallow graves with the decomposition, the carcasses were being pushed up from the soil. And this was, of course, very, uh, very distressing. To, to, to people to, to see that and smell it and whatnot. Uh, now, we are not talking about burying humans in that way, right? Uh, first and foremost. But um, the, uh, what the Danish government is going to do is in May, five months from now, they are going to remove and cremate them. Not cremate them now, okay? So in other words, they don't see any major infection risk from these uh, dead mink, uh, not direct risk unless somebody goes and, you know, deliberately goes and eats something like that or whatever it is, nor uh, any risk to the water table. Uh, the, 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 the problem has been really more an aesthetic and a problem of, you know, the, the whole, uh, such a huge number of animals buried in a small space and clearly that is going to cause problems. So there is no question uh, as far as I know that, and I, well, I'm, I'm absolutely certain there is no evidence that there was transmission from the dead mink, nor from the buried mink, over. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Nilika, do you have anything else to add to that? I, I don't have anything to add. It's just that, uh, like these news items are actually misinterpreted by a lot of people uh, and uh, given publicity in the in a very wrong manner. You know, misinterpreted uh, in, in social media and uh, leading to a lot of myths. So I think if the colleges, now the College of Community Efficiency is a very powerful college. So I think it, it, if the colleges can actually have educational activities or, or when they see all these myths being spread in Sri Lanka, if the colleges can actually uh, educate the public uh, so that these myths are limited. Because as I earlier said, I think the myths sometimes do more harm than the COVID pandemic itself. So uh, over to you, Hasit, and everybody in the college. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, to, to do something when these things happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nilika. And that brings us to the end of the, uh, the session. Uh, I uh, call upon uh, Professor Sunit Agampodi, the editor of the College of Community Fishions of Sri Lanka, to tell us the way, way forward very briefly. And then Dr. Anuji Gamage will give the vote of thanks. And I close uh, as the com uh, compere for your session. And thank you very much uh, for joining us in numbers and uh, wish you all the best for the new year. And I hope that you will stay safe and avoid catching COVID-19 uh, uh, in, the, in the coming months and the years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hasita. Uh, now, the topic we discussed today is the public health response to COVID-19 and update. And I think most of the uh, participants have already realized that we are talking about the science behind the uh, public health response in COVID-19. The public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of the people. And it's a science where all expertise get together to achieve a common health goal. And to achieve this goal, the, one of the major problem we had during past few months as uh, identified correctly by WHO is the inf infodemic we are having and a lot of myths uh, circulating around with the uh, social media and also with the uh, uh, other electronic media. So the idea of the CCPSL, College of Community Physicians, was to address this infodemic and to make sure that the uh, policy and the decision-making process is based on science rather than uh, opinions or rather than myths. A few of the things that are uh, mentioned today's, uh, during the, today's seminar is uh, mainly about the viral mutation and the new in strains of virus. And for, as for Sri Lankans, when we are looking at the way forward, uh, both speakers mentioned about uh, that the transmissibility of the new strain is very high, even though we have not detected yet in Sri Lanka. Professor Nilika mentioned that uh, we can't uh, guarantee that because we have not done uh, whole genome sequencing in all parts of the country. Anyway, we have evidence to say that there is no change in severity, but in a country like Sri Lanka, even though the severity is not higher than the previous reported strains, increasing uh, transmissibility means more cases and more cases means uh, rapidly uh, expand, uh, uh, more cases will uh, exceed the healthcare capacity of our country. So therefore we have to take uh, we have to make sure that all the public health measures are in place. And as Professor Malik mentioned, uh, even though the uh, viral mutation has happened, all known public health measures to uh, minimize the transmission are still working. So we have to make sure that we are managing the infodemics and we use science in managing this uh, situation. And for that, we will be having, the college will be having several other webinars uh, on vaccines and few other important topics. And about the about one of the major uh, question we had during this session about uh, viral survival in dead bodies, uh, the college is having a question paper already in place and will be released tomorrow because uh, the question paper is based on science, not anything else. So uh, we will be having several webinars within uh, next two few weeks. And we will be discussing about the way forward at the end of each webinar, but here today, after this session, we have to make sure that we are facing uh, the, we, we are trying our best to be one step ahead of the virus, but it seems like the virus is several steps ahead of us uh, and we'll be fighting this battle, not 
as a, a, a college, but as a scientific community with all the colleges and all the scientists and all the academics uh, getting together like we did today with, as with Professor Malik Piris and Professor Nilika. And uh, we'll be doing more webinars to discuss this in future. Over to you. Um, so, uh, as you can see, COVID-19 is a pandemic and it's a global challenge and it's rapidly evolving. Uh, I take this opportunity to extend my heartiest gratitude to the two distinguished speakers, Prof. Malik Piris and Prof. Neely Kamalivgi for joining this webinar. Thank you, sir and madam. And on behalf of the College of Community Physicians, I thank the two chairs, our moderator and all the organizers. And last but not least, the participants who joined with us today. And I hope this would benefit all of you. And that's what well, that's our hope um, to achieve through our webinars. Thank you and good night. <laughs>